This webinar was part of the International Association for the Study of the Commons World Commons Week. Are you interested in engaging with other common scholars and practitioners around the world? Become an IASC member. Uh, so this presentation is focused on uh, Indigenous peoples' relationship with climate change policies and the commons. So Indigenous peoples participate now in multi-stake uh, processes that shape changes in policies that target global commons. In this, in this talk, we will explore how the indigenous peoples from the Amazon Basin have occupied the political space created by climate change negotiations and policies during the last decade. My objective here is to go through uh, a couple of questions. How would you have indigenous peoples succeed to gain recognition and to negotiate a better access to resources and services? And are they calling into question institutional arrangements that govern the environmental transformation of the tropical forest they inhabit? For us, this is, these are critical questions since indigenous peoples have been inhabiting and managing tropical forests from the upper Amazon basin through the lower Amazon basin. So this talk aims to explore some of the new directions of indigenous social movements of South America included normative global orders as key, a key level of analysis and focusing on the way the pol this political realm articulates the relationship between the human and the environment. So just a quick note on the methodology uh, I've been using. Uh, I've been uh, doing a multi-sited ethnography fieldwork for a very long time now. Uh, I started in 2010 to follow the UNFCCC negotiations, the, the United Nations Framework uh, for Climate Change uh, Convention. And also uh, during this time, uh, I've been um, observing and sometimes participating in meetings regarding the implementation of uh, a mechanism that has been very important for indigenous peoples, which is uh, Red, which is reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. Uh, at the subnational level in the Amazon basin of Peru, Ecuador, and at the time in Bolivia, but the mechanism didn't follow through in this country. So I've been using a combination of participant observation, structure interviews, and analysis of legal documents and reports issued by institutions such as the UNFCCC, but also the Green Climate Fund, the FCPF and organizations working for nature conservation and indigenous peoples representation between 2007 and 2016. So I wanted to give you a bit of the context where um, this uh, discussion on global commons comes and the participation of indigenous peoples are situated. Um, unlike public goods, global common pool resources face problems of congestion, overuse, or degradation since they are sustractable, which make them revolvers. So if you use a global common, somebody else will be affected by its degradation, overuse, or congestion. And are Amazonian forests a global common? This is a very old question where uh, countries that are that have as part of their territory a very significant part of this territory uh, have a, a word to say. Uh, in many ways, uh, the atmosphere changes affect uh, the forest, the Amazonian forest. And in, uh, by another path, uh, Amazonian forests are subject of human pressure directly. So uh, although it's recognized that the Western Amazon Basin and the whole of the Amazon Basin are very important for ecological global systems, Earth's ecological systems. It remains a site of uh, extraction of wood, gold, oil, and gas. And uh, actors that are um, putting this pressure on the ecosystems are very different. But the result is that extractive economies have a long standing social and economic prominence, even in the most remote regions. 
and they have shaped political administration, land acquisition, and the circulation of local population. So that gives us a context of opportunities and threats. Uh, uh, you can see in the screen uh, the patches of protected areas in green and in orange the territories of indigenous peoples all over the Amazon basin. So there is a significant part of the territory that has a regime that may um, give some opportunities for indigenous peoples to negotiate the um, destiny of global commons in the Amazon basin. But at the same time, as I just said, um, there's a lot of pressure coming from gold uh, mining uh, and from um, deforestation. Um, and those are illegal economies, but at the same time, there's also pressure from legal economies in a very uh, high scale, which comes from oil um, uh, production and uh, gas production. So in this context, a context of pressure over common pool resources and um, a discussion over global commons is that global environmental com uh, governance come in. And it comes in by public investment and foreign aid pushing for environmental institutions in all the countries of the Amazon basin. And this has been very visible uh, during the 90s where the creation of protected areas and co-management of areas with indigenous peoples came through. At the same time, climate governance uh, to territories were, were very clear during the 2010, and investment on cartographic and demographic information was very important. We have now better, better data on indigenous territories that were recognized before, as well as on protected areas. And we might uh, say uh, with a big uh, grade of certainty that, that this is due uh, to uh, climate uh, governance uh, and, and climate policies. And how do, um, where are we placed as the Amazon basin in, for uh, reducing emissions from deforestation and degradation in a global scenario? Uh, Peru, Brazil, Bolivia are in a way in the second stage of uh, forest frontiers. Their uh, forests are not little, uh, they're not um, subject of uh, little disturbance, but they're more like a forest frontier. So policies have to deal with, um, with reducing deforestation here. Um, and that's what RED is trying to do. But the RED has created a narrative where indigenous peoples intervene, and they intervene mostly in the safeguard systems uh, that have a, some, an objective that do not harm. So respect indigenous rights, their participation, their participation in forest governance and the strengthening of forest governance and in some ways in benefit sharing. And this uh, is the structure uh, of red narrative, let's say, but there's also critics about how indigenous peoples may engage with this narrative on how to um, manage global commons and global policies to deal with these global commons. So there is a new economy coming into this context that I just described that is under pressure, where new institutional arrangements come in, which brings about power dynamics and new political economics over forests. So in this context, we, may have made, we might have a new form of environmentality and it means hazards, but also opportunities. So what do indigenous peoples did in this context over these last 10 years? I would argue that they have done a very interesting strategy of lobbying for rights, but as a multi-level multi strategy. So 
there's a struggle to be recognized as efficient actors against deforestation, promoting the idea that respect for rights of indigenous peoples is the best guarantee for forest resilience. And at the same time, they've learned environmental organizations uh, such as um, global uh, organizations that deal with uh, that are composed by states and uh, environmental organizations that are more like NGOs like have learned from past criticism and have built coalitions with indigenous peoples. So you can see in the second picture, the president of uh, COICA, which I'm going to explain what it is, the president, which is the um, Pan-Amazonian Organization of Indigenous Peoples, the president of the National Organization of Peru, the Ministry of Environment here of Peru, representatives of international organizations, and representatives of uh, uh, Guyana. And they have um, um, managed to uh, change some institutional arrangements that are quite relevant. So what we have now, it's a new UN platform for indigenous and local communities, clim community climate action, as well as an open multi-stakeholder dialogue on the operationalization of the local communities indigenous peoples platform that's happening in the UNF triple C process. So facing these uh, exceptionally difficult political, environmental and economic circumstances, uh, indigenous peoples have managed to, um, to craft a um, strategy of influence over different levels of governance the deal with environmental governance to shape the change and they have three expert practices a language of exceptionality although they are a minority they have recognized human rights a language of the uncertain and calculated indigenous rights and a language of remedy and compensation so indigenous peoples have become a political actor that affords knowledge, that are a stakeholder with rights and are custodians of natural resources. And as an organization, how, how do they manage to um, build this lobby? This is very interesting because out of uh, 40 years process, they have built a network that can cover the Amazon Basin, which means that they have a transnational indigenous movement, an Amazon agenda, and a system of governance. And this, the functions of this um, organization uh, foster identity, but they also foster political advocacy and it gives them legit legitimacy to speak about the whole of the Amazon basin. But this is a very difficult effort. It's a very hard effort to deal with uh, such a big network and to um, convey the message from the community level to the international level. So, there was an effort to build a narrative on how are they placed in the um, governance of reducing emissions from deforestation and forest degradation. So the normative level becomes a very important one to understand their lobbying and to understand their narrative. So what, how do we understand norm? Norm is a legitimate, legitimate behavior claim Norms are obeyed because they are considered legitimate. So uh, out of um, state-led um, policy, which reduce uh, um, emissions from deforestation, indigenous peoples of organizations have built a narrative on how to do it as indigenous people. So they built an interpretation of the norm that's legitimate out of their capacity to 
built a network that can convey a message and can take action to enforce and to uh, rather strength a global common, a common pool resource that can be um, coordinated and governed at the local level, but also at the at, um, multi-scale um, level. So they have built an interpretation, which is the Amazonian indigenous red, that shares the common goal of reducing emissions that takes into account indigenous holistic vision. So um, it, it's established borders, um, they shape people's perspective and conducts on desirable um, behaviors and acceptance of this new mechanism. So what, what is RED all about for indigenous peoples? They push for land tenure reform uh, to have a, uh, a better um, governance of land tenure as a common, um, common good then a joint mitigation and adaptation approach and benefits that comes from carbon, yes, but also non-carbon benefits, benefits that has to do with other environmental services and the mechanisms for compensation may be market and non-market and the drivers are uh, dealing with the drivers of deforestation but also of forest degradation. So they have an inter-institutional engagement and a socialization of the norms by the net networking, by their diplomacy work, and by building alliances at the local uh, uh, level, but also in the global debate. So you can see here uh, members of COICA uh, working with uh, organizations uh, that are um, expert organizations, but also with ministries of uh, international relations and environment, the environmental ministry. So this is a speech in a closing ceremony of the indigenous pavilions. The big challenges that indigenous groups face has to be is to prepare ourselves to achieve successful agreements among states, indigenous peoples, corporate sector, and uh, um, that makes them responsible of climate catastrophes. So, has this work increased COICA's agencies? Yes, COICA is now a norm entrepreneur. They have built a norm that, they, that helps frame and socialize indigenous agenda. But it also has um, um, a hazard, so it's uh, a problem, which is that uh, we can argue that ingenuity might be a um, long-standing problem that they will face in the long run. It confirms their cultural identity, it strains the unity of, uh, of indigenous peoples all over the Amazon basin, and it progress their agenda. But it can, as the, it increases their legitimacy, it also enforces um, it might enforce a discourse of biopolitics of indigeneity that can be a trap at the long run. So what are the achievements of this agenda? At least at the local level, local communities and indigenous peoples do have a platform and an incremental and participatory approach over this platform. At the same time, they're included at the constitutional level in the foreign investment programs and they do participate in this um, program at the national level. They have a dedicated grant mechanism that is tackling the problem of uh, land tenure reform. Uh, they have a total of 40 agreements that are made uh, in, in, this is an example from Peru, from the plant of investments, um, the FIP in Peru. And they have also new resources, new, um, economic resources to deal with their agenda. What are the challenges? Well, there is a big challenge with uh, information sharing. These uh, policies are very complex and they're um, 
they have a lot of technical uh, language. And um, this is a very important issue for indigenous peoples they, because they have to deal with a, with a communication problem uh, that costs a lot of effort. And at the same time, uh, that might um, um, take to an, give us another problem, which is uh, elite capture. If something has been framed, a policy has been framed with uh, dealing with a lot of uh, technical issues, it is prone to elite capture because only some actors understand what's happening and they have to do an uh, effort to share that information and they're tempted by um, keeping it uh, between themselves. And we have evidence of this all over the planet, yeah, already in the literature. And also another challenge is ensuring capacity building to avoid elite capture and to uh, have better results in information sharing. And uh, a big challenge that has to do with um, the problems with indigeneity and capitalism is avoiding eroding traditional approaches to the non-human. So there's many early lessons that we can take over this process. Uh, one that is interesting is how we can interlink in international human rights law uh, with uh, climate law. So indigenous peoples lobbying and policies have a lot of experience with human rights approach. And this interlink is very fruitful because um, there's a lot of advancements done with, um, in the uh, human rights arena, dealing with humans and non-humans um, relationships where um, we can learn a lot, uh, we can gain a lot with interlinkages between the human rights regime and the environmental regime. At the same time, uh, RED gives us a, a very interesting uh, arena to implement multi-scalar multi and multi-actors uh, uh, challenges and to strike a balance between avoiding perverse outcomes and climate actions while pursuing co-benefits uh, to ensure red uh, feasibility. It's um, something where indigenous peoples have uh, teach us a lot by their work and their lobbying. And it's uh, the way they're interpreting um, red in interpreting how to reduce emissions from deforestation and forest degradation might, might help us to deal with an overarching agenda, which is sustainable development. So we would argue that uh, the way indigenous peoples are interpreting a particular part of climate policies are teaching us how to achieve sustainable development. So facing this complex uh, context where that red deals with, which is uh, all the drivers of deforestation, by working in a multi scalar way and having an holistic vision on how to interpret and deal with a very particular mechanism, they teach us how to manage multi-stakeholder, multi-level policies. So I'm going to close with, a, with some final remarks where um, I would try to give you some lessons learned, but also <clears throat> some conclusions on what are we dealing with. So climate policies and red in particular have created definitely a room to negotiate and progress indigenous territorial agenda. This, is what, this was much needed. Indigenous peoples uh, have uh, territories recognized, but 
many times they are not uh, officially recognized in uh, in the public information uh, systems and although everybody knows there's a community there there the limits of the community are not well established and they are uh, exposed to a lot of risks so uh, many people here in peru in, in in colombia and in ecuador would argue that climate uh, negotiations open room to progress with the indigenous territorial agenda. But it also offers new hazards since um, they still don't have enough power to uh, deal with uh, the small letters of a contract. So sometimes they're prone to lose space or to other um, um, opportunities of elite capture. So although uh, climate policies give room to negotiate and, negotiate and progress the indigenous territorial agenda, we have to keep an eye on how it develops. COICA's vision, so the multi, uh, um, the Amazonian indigenous organization at the Amazonian level express Amazonian indigenous uh, visions on red and represent a counter proposal to read at the global narrative, read global narrative. So we have to uh, recognize that uh, COICA has um, managed to build a counter norm that has a legitimacy to establish itself in the transnational level. And this is, um, as I tried to explain in this uh, webinar, an effort to deal with a global commons, coming from a multi-level effort. Uh, it is not um, adopted as such by every single country that has an Amazonian territory, but it has been adopted as such in Peru, for example. So indigenous red, it's inscribed in our national determined contributions. And another remark that I would like to stress is that red debate has had a positive impact in indigenous network agency. Although it gives, um, a, it gives a very important tool to negotiate, it, it strengthens the agency of a representation that is changing at the same time. So uh, we can argue that indigenous peoples do have more agency out of this process, but it is a still a working process. Indigenous organizations have changed a lot during this 10 uh, years process that we have behind. Uh, since uh, um, reducing uh, deforestations from for forest degradation was recognized in the UNFCCC uh, process in 2007. But it's definitely the case that indigenous peoples do have more agency, do have more arenas in the climate um, mechanism. And uh, it's uh, something that we definitely have to look carefully. So I hope that these uh, remarks answer our first questions here. So indeed, they have gained recognition to negotiate a better access to resources and services, but still the context is very hard. So there's a lot of attention to be, uh, that we have to give to the, the results that are ongoing. And indeed, they are calling into question some of the principles of this global narrative on red, giving a holistic vision on how to deal with this agenda, including um, um, mitigation and adaptation to climate change at the same time, including a holistic vision that gives uh, co-benefits uh, as a particular and an important place in, uh, in red and um, 
a very important place to the re to uh, reform land rights reform to reinforce uh, indigenous people's access and good recognition to their lands as global commons become a more important point in the environmental agenda. So I think uh, I've covered the points I wanted to, to discuss in this uh, webinar. I hope it was clear and that you have uh, some questions about it um, uh, on how this uh, strategy uh, falls through and what the results are and what are we um, looking um, uh, ahead. So thank you very much. Thank you, Deborah. That was great. So right now I open the floor for questions. You can type your questions on Q&A box. And if you are, again, if you are calling in uh, star nine, and then you can raise your hand and I can unmute you and then you can ask your questions. So the first question, do you uh, see any connection on the increase of vulnerability of indigenous peoples with increase of advocacy in like considering that you have um, conflicts on land conflicts and uh, the expand of like the agriculture frontiers? How that changes from country to country, and if you perceive that working with indigenous people? Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, so, uh, in each country, the um, scenario varies, so the context is different. So, for example, in Peru, the agricultural uh, frontier is extending, but uh, we don't have uh, the same scenario that is happening in Brazil, for example where the frontier, the agricultural frontier has been extending in the last 10 years in a very, very rapid pace. And at the same time, that affected indigenous people's um, organizations. And I would argue that the, the main threat actually was uh, mining uh, for, for their, uh, I mean, in organizational terms. Because mining and oil uh, have a lot of cash that may come into indigenous peoples um, or um, communities uh, at a very rapid, uh, at the very first moment, and then they degradate so much their land that they have to go out of it. Uh, that's the case, at least in Peru. But if you see, if you compare the cases, I would say that Ecuador and Peru do have a similar scenario, a comparable scenario, but Brazil has taken a very different um, path, which is very worrisome actually, uh, where indigenous people's organizations are, are, uh, are being weakened. And although they try to engage with the COICA process, the process has been uh, more accepted in the, in the upper Amazon basin. What we're seeing now is um, some efforts from uh, indigenous peoples uh, protected uh, territories. There is a new trend that is just happening now to engage with uh, Ecuadorian and Peruvian organizations to, uh, to propose to uh, the Green, the GEF, the Green Fund, some mechanisms to protect their lands. And that's a very promising uh, path. Uh, but yes, uh, the pressure uh, over land has increased the advocacy and at the same time has pushed uh, organizations to go to the supranational level. And the result then when it comes back to the territory can vary dealing with the context. And context is very important. So in Peru and Ecuador, where the country is smaller, where um, there's um, recognition over uh, treaties at the multi-level that have been respected. Uh, if we have, like, uh, if we 
look at the environmental um, 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 international level, actually uh, many of the upper Amazon countries do respect their, their conventions. But we can't say the same for, from bigger countries that do have bigger uh, pressures over their lands. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. Can you um, unshare your screen so we can see? Uh, oh, unshare the screen so we can see your full video. Thank you. Yeah. Button, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how is that. I think it's. Uh, just a second. I would say, is this? Yes. Is it that? Perfect. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> So, any more questions from the audience? Let's give a little time. Yes. Okay. Where is it? Okay. So another one is how do you deal with ex external forces supporting international conflict, uh, for example, Venezuela and Colombia? That's a really, really good question. So uh, Venezuela has been uh, a very um, shy actor, um, indigenous people from Venezuela, haven't been engaged in the in the multi, uh, in COICA uh, very much. Like they have been engaged during uh, the very beginning. And um, then uh, a fact, national factors uh, have uh, diminished their participation. And, and this is something very particular to Venezuela. But in Colombia, where conflict uh, is uh, important for indigenous peoples, um, indigenous organizations do engage in multilateral processes and gain uh, some recognition at the multilateral level and they have uh, uh, gained some elements in the, uh, in the national arena. Um, so dealing with violent conflicts by um, like uh, I remember once that I was speaking with other people that are specialists in, with violent um, conflicts. And what was uh, interesting about the indigenous peoples lobbying in Peru was that at the same time that we had Bagua, which is a very, uh, we had um, an open conflict in Peru dealing with indigenous peoples and the state. And um, more than 20 people got killed in um, a manifestation in the north of Peru. And at the same time, the same leader that have, was processed out of this conflict, the same indigenous leader that had to escape from Peru to, to avoid um, jail, he was dealing with these environmental government, governance schemes. So you see that this is a path to have um, um, contentious, uh, um, politics that is a democratical process where you don't have a violent path. So I would argue that uh, climate uh, negotiations and climate policies might be um, a path to deal with some, also having the same actors on board mostly, have a process of contentious politics that does not imply violence. And it's not that is the panacea, but it's an, um, an, a path to have the same actors sitting in a table and negotiating for a global common. And it can help us out because we have the same actors on board or not exactly the same, but you know, 40% of them are the same to um, uh, bring some peace in uh, a confrontation that otherwise would be very, very violent. So Katya asked, how could 
in, we improve the situation of indigenous peoples with the agreement of Iskazu. Mm. Yeah, Skazu is a very um, prom prom uh, promising uh, way forward because Skazu has a, it's not as specialized, you know, here with red, they had to give a holistic vision out of a very, um, um, a mechanism that was dealing with carbon and change the narrative. But Skazu actually has a broader narrative. It deals with a sustainable development pro problem uh, um, issue actually with a, um, a mechanism that it's uh, as broad and as open as the problem. So I would argue that ISCASU would help a lot of indigenous peoples. The only problem is that um, it's not a problem, but it is still not defined how it is going to be uh, financed, um, included in national uh, budgets. Because at least with uh, RED, we have uh, direct um, um, compensations for indigenous peoples that engage with the protection of their forests. So you not only have the multilateral process, but out of bilateral funds, uh, uh, and I didn't spoke about that, but it's very important that uh, Norway and Germany give bilateral funds to Peru so that Peru opened public national funds to give compensation for indigenous peoples and hopefully benefit sharing when the mechanism of PES, of payment for ecosystem services, get a final set and gets ongoing. So I think that Escazú, it's a very, very interesting opportunity and uh, we just need to see uh, how the financial flow Will come to um, ensure that the goals are met. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time for questions, but that was great. I'm gonna have like um, my conclusion remarks on behalf of IASC and all World Commons Week organization. We want to thank you so much for your time. That was great an amazing presentation and i want to remind people that we are having it's true on the middle of our 24 hour webinar series so check out the page iasc page and look for the webinars we have so many interesting speakers from all over the globe and uh, in november a iasc is holding uh, their first virtual conference in July 2019, it is holding its biennial in-person conference in Lima, Peru. And the deadline for the abstracts paper due is November 15th, 2018. Um, and so thank you so much for everybody that watched the webinar. Thank you so much, Deborah, for um, giving your time and this amazing presentation. And I'm gonna close the webinar here. Thank you for that can be see you in lima <laughs> <laughs> yes hopefully <laughs> bye bye bye